Welcome to Conversations with the Black Girl Blogger podcast, where you will hear amazing human interest stories from everyday people. They will inspire you, they will encourage you, and they will help you to overcome all of what you are going through in your life. I am your host, Aisha Morgan, and let's meet today's guest. Today is our first episode in our Manuary series, and if you've been following my social media, you know that Manuary means that all of our guests this month are going to be men, and let me tell you guys, I've had some great conversations with these men, um, so much so that today's episode with Paul is going to be a part one and a part two, so Today, you will be listening to part one of our episode, and next Wednesday, you will hear part two. So let's get in to part one of my conversation with Paul Goss. So, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Um, I am Paul, as my cousin has said. Um, I'm a personal trainer. I am a basketball trainer as well. I am I've been married for a year now. I have an 18-month-old son named Astro. And uh, yeah, I'm just trying to figure things out as we as we go through this pandemic and you know, hopefully see the other side of it. Uh, yeah. It's been crazy, but it's been a blessing because I've been able to be with my son and my family more. So that is so true. That's the same thing that I felt like. Yeah, it was hard having Kingsley and not being able to see like your family family. But I didn't have to take off work because we were already at home working when I gave birth to her. So they were like, oh, well, just have your doctor say you can work remotely and then you don't have to like use your days to take off work. So I was working remotely. It it worked out like I was. Yeah. my wife, my wife is an entertainer, so she was a she was home because you know nothing was open as right. far as entertainment. And I work really close, like maybe like five minutes from the house when I, when the gyms and stuff did open back up. So, got it. Was- so you mentioned that you um, coach kids in basketball. So how did you get into it? Like, did you play basketball when you were younger? What's the background about that? Okay, so my older brother, you know, he was an athlete. He played basketball. And, of course, you know, my my older brother is my role model, is my hero. So wanting to be like my older brother, of course, I tried to do everything he was doing. He was playing basketball. He was playing football. He was doing track. So um, at a young age, I was introduced to, you know, going to his practices and just working out with him. And that became a passion of mine. Yeah, and I, I really like gravitated towards basketball more than anything. And okay. uh, then I was watching college basketball games and high school basketball games and then NBA games. And I just I could see that being me. And um, one thing I take from it is my brother really pushed me to be the best that I could be. And yeah. then I also was able to, like, watch him and see what he was good at and see where he failed, maybe like. He could have been a better student or, you know, he should have trained a little bit more on this and that. And I implemented that into my regiment. And um, that's how I, you know, I think I got really, really good really early on at a young age. I don't agree. (laughs) I think I think you got really good because you were smaller than all of us and it forced you to be better because (laughs) your growth spurt came a little bit later. Well, so, yes. so another thing is um, my uncle, my uncle BJ and, you know, his friends, I was the youngest by far by maybe what, besides my brother, probably like 10 years. Yeah. Eight. And then on top of that, I was short and I was fat. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, um, but they used to always tell me, yo, you got to practice. You got to, you got to practice your dribbling. You got to practice your shooting. Like you're not good enough to get on the court. And I was mad, but I still did work to get better at those things Yeah, so that I could get on the court. And then when my Uncle Paul was there, he would make them uh, let me play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, 
So I used to like when he was playing because then I knew I played for sure because he was like, if he ain't playing, if he ain't playing. That's so, right. So, but um, no, nah, it was just all motivation. You know, um, there's two ways you can take things. You can take things negatively and, you know, deter you from working harder or you can turn it into a positive and make you work harder. So I was able to uh, be fortunate enough to turn it into a positive and work harder. And, you know, just because I wanted to play with them and I wanted to prove to them that I was good enough to play with them. And yeah. it didn't matter the age and all the backyard wars that me and my brother had when he would beat me like a hundred to one <laughs> and then I would cry and we would fight afterwards. But that was just preparing me, you know, to be mentally tough. I didn't realize it then. Yeah. But I, I realized that now, like he was preparing me to be mentally tough when, you know, things get hard. And every day I would still come out the next day, like I'm going to beat him knowing that I wasn't, but you know, I was going <laughs> to give it, I was going to give it my all. So um, just, you know, just, certain things that you take from your childhood that you don't even realize yeah, that, that are building you up to be the person that you are is it's crazy when you look back at it and you can just pick pinpoint some things that, you know, you, that stick with you to this day. Yeah. So when do you think was the turning point for you in basketball or just in sports in general? Um, for basketball, it was probably after my freshman year. After my freshman year, I averaged like 25 points and I had a, our team wasn't very good, but individually I did very good. Yeah. And going into that summer, like going into the summer to be a sophomore, um, I beat my brother one-on-one. -on -one. He couldn't beat me anymore. And then that's when I was like, I have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> right. All the stuff that I did like during the season, it really didn't matter. When I was able to beat my older brother one-on-one, -on -one, that's when I was like, I'm a good basketball player. Yeah. I, I arrived. That was like my milestone goal right there at that point. And then um, just after that, just um, like sophomore, junior, senior, senior year, just adding things to my game that um, I struggled with the, the, the previous year really uh, helped me. And just and then I was able to get on a really good AAU team where I played with like J.R. Smith and Andrew Bynum. And those are two NBA players that went out of high school. Mm -hmm. um, just the level of competition and seeing like where you rank among the people nationally was an eye opener also and able to give me some humbleness to, you know, continue to work harder and get better. So on your off season, did you have a coach or you kind of just did your own thing? Um, I had my brother, <laughs> you know, I had my brother, I had my cousins, you know, my cousin Andrew and, you know, some friends in the neighborhood like Anthony Butler, uh, Will Hill, uh, Greg Shoemaker, all the guys from Brotmanville that played basketball, you know, we were always, you know, battling it out like every day we would find time to get on the court. So, yeah, you know, having, a, having a good group of guys around you or people around you that's also going to support you and um, have you do the right things. And then, you know, I had great coaches along the way as well that really put in extra time, like Sean Collins and his dad, um, that's my high school coach, really put in, um, a lot of extra time. And of course, my parents, you know, my mom was yeah. always, and my dad, you know, we would drive an hour just to go to AAU practices. And, you know, just that as a parent now seeing like all the stuff that they, a parent has to deal with on top yes. of making sure that your kids have a, have a life. And there's two other kids also that are active and playing sports. So just my parents, you know, you know, uh, sacrificing some of their time and stuff to get us where we had to go was uh, also a major part because I would have never been able to do it without them. Yeah. So once you realize like you're in high school and it's kind of like, all right, I think I got it. I found it. This is it. When did you start thinking about like the next level of college and then beyond? Uh you know, probably like not till maybe my junior year of uh, of high school because like everybody was just always like, "Oh, you're doing this, you're doing that," and it's it's so good. And but I never looked at it like that, like because I prepared myself. Like I, nothing was like surprising to me that what I was doing. For yeah, my, for me and my close knit friends and guys who know me and watch me grow up. I would say they were proud, but maybe not surprised. You know what I mean? Because they watched me uh, put in work and they watched me grow over the years. So it was kind of just like 
walk in in a way like yeah I just ex- this is what I expected of myself um I set high expectations and I prepared myself for for the moments that I was that was put put in front of me and I felt like for the most part that I was able to like you know grasp those moments and take full advantage of it but you also played football so how did you decide what you kind of were gonna focus on past um, high school the craziest thing is a lot of people say that I was better at football, but that wasn't my passion. Like football yeah. was fun, you know, because all my friends were playing football and, you know, it was just like, okay, let me go try football. I didn't play football my first year till seventh grade. And, you know, then I played all through high school, but it wasn't my passion. And yeah, the decision for me was what could I play at a higher level? for the longest, like knowing me, um, and it was basketball. And I even tried football right after college, which is crazy. Um, right after college, my senior year, I went and worked out with the Jets um, because okay. they had moved their facilities to Florham Park, which is up by Seton Hall, it's like 20 minutes away. Mm-hmm. And I actually worked out for the Jets. They really liked me. And they sent me to Vegas. It was called the United Football League. I played in there for three months. I hurt my hamstring. Oh. Uh, yeah, I hurt my hamstring. So I had to go to like Alabama and see some special Dr. Andrews, like a special doctor or whatever. But um, I wind up at that very point because I didn't want the what ifs. So the opportunity came and I was like, all right, let me just cross this off because I always did have an itch to see like, hey, would you be able to, you know, play at that level or play in the NFL? And it, it just answered my question that I should have been playing basketball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I did okay, but just like mentally and physically, it's really taxing and yeah, it's a tough sport. Like going from four years in college to that was, was really tough. So I was like, now nah, I'm gonna go back and play basketball. So you said Seton Hall. How did you make the decision um, when you were being recruited to go to Seton Hall for college? My, my recruitment process was was str- was very stressful for me in a way because the fact that I was being recruited for football, basketball, and track. And, you know, it can get overwhelming when you got, like, coaches calling in. You got letters coming in every day, and you're trying to schedule your visits. Um, so I, I, I ruled out track. Um, pretty early on I rode out track and it was between football and basketball and I was so unsure of what I wanted to do yeah because I really wanted to do both but a lot of schools would not let me because they would say you will be a high recruit on the football side or you'll be a high recruit on the basketball side so I played my um, group one state championship at Rutgers and Seton Hall was there to watch me play they had a late transfer and um, they asked me to come up on like an unofficial visit. I went up, you know, I really liked the school. It was small school, perfect for me. Um, and they were in the Big East, which was the best conference in the country at the time with the, with the 16 teams that were in it. And it was pretty much a no brainer for me. It was close to home. You know, I could get home, family could come see me. So I made my decision to go to Seton Hall and, you know, it, it uh, it was a it was a it was a great ride, but it was a very rocky ride at times. So um, it just helped me, like I said, become a better person. I think that like too, when you um, make that transition from high school to college, um, everybody just thinks that it's so easy. But I don't know about you, but when I went to college and ran track, it was just like a totally different state of mind, like everybody is you meaning like everybody's as good as you so your work ethic has to change and like it's just a whole new eye-opening world so did that happen for you or was it kind of like you prepared yourself so you were you were ready for it um uh I would say like because of the the, my level of AAU would be you know being like Nike All-American camp and me being able to see a lot of the players like high division one, the, the level of competition wasn't tough. It was just grasping that you're like an, an adult now. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to hold your hand like and make sure you do things. And 
just uh, time management, you know, like yeah. things like that, like, you know, going to practice, making sure you eat, got to study, you got to pass this test. It was just amplified to a, to a different magnitude. And then, you know, now you're traveling and you got to do work and you, it's just balancing everything and still, you know, finding some time for yourself. So that was the hardest thing for me. It just was, you know, balancing the whole college life, trying not to party and trying to stay <laughs> and doing different things, you know? And then, you know, the, like my freshman year, I was homesick. Like I wanted to be home because I was never away from home at like that extended period of time. So yeah, all those things were tough my freshman year, but I felt like uh, it got easier. Like I didn't even want to come home like my sophomore and junior senior. I'm like, I'm still up at school, you know, like, so just, just getting acclimated to that whole college life experience and being a student athlete. And everybody's saying like, it's so fun, but it's really not. <laughs> like, yeah. They demand a lot out of you, you know, and just being exhausted most of my freshman year, just from trying to, you know, find time to get on the court and, you know, just have a social life. It's, it was really challenging at times, but um, I learned from it. And, you know, like there was times that <laughs> when I'm like, yo, Paul, if you don't pass this test, you're going to be ineligible. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's like stressful like yeah now I gotta study super super hard but we got a big game coming up you know so yeah you know just finding that balance and you know not always walking that fine line of being eligible and ineligible is really important as an as a student athlete yeah and I think that it you're right like everybody feels like athletes just have it so easy because you have things but it's like we have things because we work for those things it's not like it's handed to us like we're not the manager of passing out towels right. like you right. work no yeah you definitely work like people don't realize that like you go from high school but then you go to college and they, you're even you're told what to do even more like yeah be, be here be your whole day is scripted out for you pretty much for four years and you know for me it was tough because my junior year I tore my ACL Mm. so I missed my whole junior year I think I missed my red shirt by like four basketball minutes like on the court it was either games played or minutes and I think I was like four minutes over a red shirt so I didn't get a red shirt oh I man missed, missed my whole junior year because I broke my hand missed seven games and I think we were like 11 or 13 games into the season and I tore my ACL so I missed seven games and then played in two and tore my ACL and I was out for the season for my whole junior year. Senior year, um, I was like 65%, you know, coming off ACL, big knee brace. Um, so those were probably like the two toughest years of like my life as far as like sports, because of, that was like the first time I ever had like a, a major, major, major injury. Yeah. Coming off like a really, really, really good sophomore year where I'm like, yo, maybe if I have this type of junior year, I could possibly get into the NBA, being that I was, like, second in the country in steals. I broke the Big East single season steals record. I broke Seton Hall um, single season steals record. So I was, like, on the defensive side of the ball, I was, like, doing really well because, you know, what my coach asked of me, you know, that's what he asked of me. So I was super, super, super scorer to, like, a super, super defender. And I was picked to win like defensive player of the year in the Big East and like best on ball defender in the country. So I had a lot of things going for me. And then a couple games to my senior year, just all derailed. And it's like, okay, NBA is out the picture. What do you do next? And you still have a whole senior year to go through, you know? So yeah, it was really taxing and it was really tough. But, you know, I did have good people around me and I had family and friends that you know kept my spirits up and you know they're like oh that's not the end of it then that's when I went to overseas because I really didn't know too much about overseas and then that's when I kind of you know was looking into overseas and how that basketball life would be so what was the process of that because um I feel like it's good that you did that because I personally like know a lot of people who you know in college played basketball and they went overseas as opposed to going to the NBA because it's so competitive. Like even if you make it, you're not guaranteed to be on anybody's team. So 
<laughs> that can become, you know, it can kind of bruise some egos. So I, they would just go straight overseas. Yeah, I tell people all the time, um, if you look at like professional sports, basketball is the hardest sport to become like an NBA basketball player. Like up the, to be at the top of that sport, there's what, 300 and now what, 330 Division one schools. Yeah. Then you got Division two, then you got Division three, then you got junior college, then you got NAIA, then you got overseas people that are trying to get into the league, and it's only for 60 spots. Right. And so, high school kids that right, straight out of high way. school, yeah. G League, whatever. Now it's only 60 spots. So you're you're like one percent chance of making it to the NBA. <laughs> like yeah. if you look at the big picture of it to where all these other sports have like six rounds of like 60, 70 players, you know, like baseball, hockey, soccer, and, and football, they have a, a million rounds and basketball has two rounds, 60 players total. Like, mm. And it, you're not even guaranteed to get on the team if you're not in a lottery pick. <laughs> so Got if you're not like the first like 15 or the third, I think it's 15 in the first round, you're not even guaranteed to be on a team. So it's it's definitely not easy and you definitely have to put the work in and just sometimes get lucky or be tall or, you know, have something that you're really great at. Yeah. Um, and but the overseas option is, is amazing, man. There, there's so many teams and places out there that pretty much treat you just as if you were an NBA player. Yeah. So what was your process like? What was. Did you have to get an agent first? Did you yeah, kind of? I was, uh, I talked to a few agents and, you know, they, they tell you what they have to offer, what connections they have in, in different countries, because all agents have different connections to different countries with different teams. So once you sign with the agency, they'll be like, okay, we're going to make you a college highlight. We're going to chop it up. We're going to ship it out to teams. And it's pretty much a bidding war after that. Like, you know, the highest, the highest, the highest paying club will you will pretty much try to go to. And then you look into like the living situations and if you get cars and meals and all these things that you learn, you know, from other people who's been over there or yeah. you're from experience yourself. Like my first year, I didn't know anything, you know, I didn't know anything about, you know, getting a guaranteed contract and, you know, getting incentives and make sure that it's in writing. You know, my first year was like, I ain't never going back again. Yeah. <laughs> it was rough. I went to Germany my first year, which is actually a, a very good basketball country. And we did not get paid. Like, oh, like well, I was there for almost 10 months and I think I got paid three. But the, the thing was, like, it was my first year, so I had to stick out that first year. Yeah. I had to get, my, I had to get numbers. I had to get film. So it was like either you finish the year or this first year may be your last year because teams want to see that you played. They want to see your numbers. They want to see your film. They want to see that you're active. We were lucky enough to meet, like, a really, really rich basketball fan out there. Mm-hmm. And he uh, was paying our salary. Oh, like man. Basketball player salary. But the good thing about Germany is if you're in that country, you don't get paid. I mean, we had to get lawyers. We had to do all of that stuff. But you will get your money from the country. And then they'll go back to the club. And to get it from them. Get it from them. So um, Germany is really solid. It's It was like one of my most – it was one of the, my uh, – most favorite place to be actually it was really like nice and clean it's a lot of things you can see yeah it can be really 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 rough um and it all depends on like uh your personality and who you are like you gotta really be in tune with who you are like if you're a family body like homebody family person it can be really isolating being that you could be the only american you can be the only one that speaks English. Like mm. there's some I've been I've been in where players had to like translate what the coach was saying. Me like loving basketball, like coach <laughs> yeah. give you the ball and do this and that and that and that. You know, so yeah, yeah, it, it can be tough at times. It's like I'm saying, every 
it's not for everybody. There's a lot of basketball players I know that are that were really, really good and just were like, it ain't for me. Yeah. It, it could be really tough at times. So after that first year, did you get a whole nother agent or did you kind of meet with yours? Like, hey, we need to talk. No, after after that year, I, I was done. Like I was done with them agents, you know. Um, I finished the year out. I had a really good year. Um, I made like uh, first team out there, uh, first team defense. I made first team. So I did really well. Um, our team was like middle of the pack. And then I went to I went to Slovakia after that. Okay. Which was uh it was different because I went from being one of the youngest players to like the old. I was on a really, 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 really young team. So I was like the old guy on the team and like looking for leadership. And I was in another crazy situation, but it wasn't money wise. Like we were getting we would get paid, but we would get paid a little bit late, but you would get your money. Yeah. The thing was they messed up my visa. <laughs> oh. So you know, you you get like you get 90 days to be in the country and then you need a working visa. Right. To be there longer. So that they, they messed up my visa and they were um they asked me to go to like Croatia and say I lost my passport till they could get me a working visa and all this paperwork. Like I was calling my mom and everything yeah. trying to get them to send me some paperwork in time to get this done, but it, it didn't it didn't happen. So I was like, I ain't going to Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going home. Like <laughs> <laughs> so um and I was having like a, a really really good season like like Slovakia is a really good basketball league to be in and to build off of yeah so I was able to I was upset because if I was able to stay there I would have been able to build my resume and you know we were I was on a really good team but nah I wasn't comfortable with yeah. <laughs> hotel for three or four weeks you know yeah without my, but nah I was I that was that, I said I, I'm going home <laughs> my teammates did it you know it worked out you know kudos to them but nah not me so <laughs> I went home and then uh you know I just left it in God's hands and I did have you know some numbers and some film from that season and I was able to get to England which I, I wandered up okay. playing for two years and my agent he was like what is the what's the major what's the most important thing that you need like out of the out of them and i was like straight up i need to get my money on time right my paperwork right and i need to be in good living situations like the money is whatever i'll take less money but these are like three things that i need for my for my for like for me to be as productive as i possibly can i need at least this is the bare minimum that i need yeah and I wound up going to England and I played at Newcastle, which was a, you know, a amazing club. They had great history. They were like the best team in England. Um, really professional, took care of the players that like, that was probably like my favorite place to play. Mm -hmm. Fans were amazing. Like you just felt like you were at home, you know, you, you felt like, okay, this is like the NBA of overseas. Like they really yeah. Great things like fans bring you food. They find out what your favorite food was, candy. You know, you stayed in nice hotels. Living living space was was great. You had your own car. We had to like visit schools to teach them about like nutrition, no smoking, healthy eating, and fitness. So we oh, visited, that's cool. Yeah, we visited hospitals. So it was it was cool. Um, when I was out there, I really got to like, you know, go out and see like all the like war, like world war sites and all the places they had battles because England was a lot of things like that took place. You right. Know, castle. So I learned from my third year to really, really engulf yourself into the culture of where you're at. You know, like I, I could have did it more in Germany and, and Slovakia, but when I got to England, you know, I was sightseeing. And then after England, I went to Morocco for two years, which was like totally different. You yeah. Know? From going from there to Morocco, where where it's like you get an appreciation of what you got. You know got what it. I mean? Yeah. Like there's rich places, but like the, the clubs that you play on are usually in like 
poor towns where, you know, people don't have money. Like when we first got there, we used to walk to practice because we didn't have a car. Like we had a driver. We didn't have a car. But if the driver ever came, like sometimes she ain't come. Oh. <laughs> but luckily, yeah. like like maybe like a, a 10 minute walk. And it's normally always warm. It's not cold out there. So we just walked to practice. Like, like it was three of us. We walked to practice. Um, and when we were walking to practice, she would see like kids out there playing soccer, like barefoot or like mm. nothing. And then they come up to us and they'd be like, after season, can we, they pointed at your sneakers. You know, like they wanted our sneakers, like after the oh, season, okay. they knew we were basketball players. Yeah. They know when you're coming in town. Like they know when the season is, they know what houses you stay in because the athletes just stay in the same houses year after year. Right. So the, all the people know, um, so, like, after the season, um, me and my teammates, we just took all our stuff. We just had stuff on our back, and we just took all our stuff out and just laid it out for all the kids to have all our clothes and sneakers and socks and everything. Draws. They took everything. <laughs> <laughs> they took everything. So, like, um, being over there really, you know, gives you appreciation of what you have at home. Yeah. We often take things for granted as you know, Americans, like, that's what I've learned, you know, like, a lot of Americans take things for granted, and then you go to other places, and then you can really see, like, why people do want to come here, because I'm like, why right. y'all want, want to come here? Yeah, like, that's me, too. I'm always like, this is not that great, like. Right, right, you know, but for them, it's like, hey, you live here, you'll see why, you know? Right, so yeah. It, it gives you perspective on, you know, just getting out of your area, getting out of your, your country, out of your state, get into another country and, you know, seeing different things really for me was great. Like it taught me how to interact with people, all types of people, you know, yeah. how to like, yo, go get you a translation book and learn about what these people are saying and doing. And, you know, <laughs> because, yeah. you know, I've, I've been on all, all sides of the coin where you just like, teammates are telling you the wrong thing on purpose because they don't think that you know or you, they think that you're too ignorant to try to understand about what's going on. Mm. And then when they do see like, okay, he understands enough that we just can't be telling him anything. Yeah. They, they treat you with a different type of respect. Like, yo, I thought that you were going to be just an arrogant American who comes in here thinking you're better than anybody. We know you went to Seton Hall. We know you played here. We, we heard about it for two months before you came. After yeah. you, <laughs> you know, like, we're tired of hearing about it. That's what they're like, basically, you know what I mean? Yeah. But then once they, like, see that, like, you know, you're just coming in there to, to you know, help the team win and you're just a, a, a overall good person. And everybody usually, like, you know, lets down their guard and then they'll take you out to eat. They'll show you the places to eat. They'll show you the American spots. So, I mean, with that being said, it's just about, you know, just trying to be a good person and, you know, your foundation of what you were, what you were brought up, you know, being taught like by your parents and yeah. respect for everybody and just, you know, going into things with an with a, with a open mind and not a closed mind. So I have, when you left Morocco, was that it or did you go I somewhere? To Morocco, I went to Morocco. And then I played in Dominican Republic. Okay. Which was like totally different too, because it's like really lax, it's super hot. Like you practice outside underneath of like a pavilion with a basketball court because it's so hot and they don't got air conditioning. But the mm. game like a really, really nice, cool air conditioned gym. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. they ain't about to be cutting the lights on and doing all of this stuff for practice. <laughs> so but, you know, it was it was cool. It was fun. You know, I was like, oh, man, I'm not Dominican Republic, you know. So it was like a vacation slash work. Yeah. You know, it was different. And then um, I got to, like, play in Dubai for a little bit, which was cool. Um, just seeing, like, how they built that up, the, up that whole place in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, like, I'm like, this is crazy. It's so expensive out there, though. I'm like, I got to get up out of here because. Yeah, they, I heard. They, yeah, they're driving, like, Corvette. Or like, a Corvette and a Porsche is like a Honda Accord. Like, <laughs> it ain't nothing, you know? Like You just see them everywhere. Everywhere. Like, all high-end cars. Like, the buildings and 
like skyscrapers and we you know we were going to like the Burj Khalifa like what's the highest building in the world and yeah. they're like telling us how it was built and he's like these people probably made like three hundred dollars total building this building like so it, it you know it was it was interesting and you know just getting to see different places and different things was cool and traveling the world I mean for free necessarily is pretty cool also so yeah you can't beat that so was that the last place that you played? Yeah, that was the last place I played because um, I was getting a little bit older and I took a year to um, finish school. I had a, okay. I, I had a class to finish um, because I went and played football. I had a class to take in that summertime, but they was offering me some money that I needed. And uh, it, was, it was enough money that I'm like, yo, I'm out. <laughs> I'll come back yeah. and finish the class later. So um, luckily, you know, like I had like the same academic advisor were there and um, one of my former teammates was an assistant coach there. So oh, okay. I reached out to them and I'm like, hey, man, I'm trying to come back and, and finish school, but I ain't paying for it. Like, <laughs> what would you know, what do I need to do? So they were, you know, they, they like, yo, just come to class and, you know, just take it serious. So, you know, I had to go back and take like a, a senior seminar class. Okay which was cool. You know, I did find a pass and that was like a personal achievement for me to make sure you finish school because, you know, life after basketball. Right. is coming. And we actually had talks like, yo, what do, what, what do you think I can do with my, with my degree and, and, and certain things. But uh, I think I'm going to stay on the sports side. That's why I became a personal trainer. Now, hearing you say that, because I feel like when we graduated, um, college, like me and my teammates, um, I don't really feel like we were transitioned out into the real world, if that makes sense. It's like, okay, you're about to be done. Thank you for your, you know, being on the team and doing all these things. Come back and visit us and don't forget to give your alumni money. Like, <laughs> like that was it. And oh, yeah. Like I wrote this blog post because kind of talking about you're just thrown out there with no type of transition, not just like being an adult, but like working out. Like I wrote about the fact that like, I don't know how to work out to be fit. I know how to work out to train right. for something. Yes. And like, you know, going to the store and this might sound trivial to people, but going to the store and having to buy like shoes and then being realizing how much a sports bra costs and like different things. And I'm like, I don't even know how to buy tennis shoes, like running shoes, right. because somebody always gave me running shoes. And if I needed orthopedics, I went and got orthopedics from the school. Right. So it's like, how? Now like, what? like, how do I even do this? So for me, it was similar to your story, but it was overseas because it was like, you know, high school, never had a job, just played sports. And then I was good enough to be on really good teams, like even for basketball to where they like, they pay for my flights, they pay for my sneakers, they pay for my house and they gave, they yeah. paid for food. Like in high school for basketball, I really didn't pay for anything because I was on a, like a Nike sponsored team. Right. So I didn't really pay for anything. And then going into college, you don't pay for anything. Like nope. <laughs> no books, no housing, no, no, you don't pay for anything. And then you get like money, like Pell Grant, and then you uh -huh. get like uh meal money. So you you know, I mean you you're 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 finding ways to get money still to have to do things in life. And then it was like, okay, overseas. Now it's like, oh, okay, I get paid, but I gotta go grocery shopping. I got to cook my own food. Yeah. They, they don't give us like treatment. Like, like I'm used to getting like STEM machines and uh, game readies and all that stuff. They don't even have it. You in a bucket with ice, <laughs> <laughs> like a big trash can full of ice. That's your cold tub. Yeah. Before you buy ice and you're putting it in, in your tub and filling it up and sitting in it. You like, like things like that. Like, like you just had to learn on the fly. And that's where I like my mom, you know, I would watch my mom cook, but I really put everything that, you know, she taught me into, into action when I was over there because it gets expensive. Yes. If you don't have like 
place, like some places don't have places for you to eat. Like they don't give you meals. So you gotta like either you eat out every night, which is really expensive, and you'll wind up if you're if you're not making like thousands of dollars, you'll wind up not coming home with any much, money. Much to yeah. show. You know what I mean? So I really learned how to like budget my money and cook. And like my first month, two months out there, my my strategy to save money was I eat peanut butter and jelly for, for two months. <laughs> That's all I ate. Yeah. And I had like, that was probably like my, my, my third or fourth year out there. And then like I had rookies come in and they were like, bro, why are you eating peanut butter and jelly? Like, <laughs> I think because when you see your check and you see my check. Right. You'll know why. You don't know why. You know what I mean? And then the following, yeah. they're like, yo, bro, I want that peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> like, so it's been cool because like, Throughout every year, you have like certain teammates and guys that you know that just become lifelong friends. Like, yeah, they live all over the place, but you know we still we still check in and keep in touch. And you know some of them are still playing, some of them are on the other side, of, like me. But you know it's 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 really like a, a a different world. You know, as an athlete, you know, yeah, like people are like yo, you gonna join the frat, bro? I'm like I'm kind of in one, like yeah. <laughs> You know, like I got my teammates, my boys go to Rutgers, my boys go here, my boys go here. When I go out to, to that that city or that town, you know, I call them and, you know, you can check on them. And then some are even in Philly that I play with overseas so that I keep in touch with. Yeah. So it's just, a, it's just a, it's a cool thing, you know, to be an athlete, you know. It has its perks, but it's yeah. also very, very taxing. And like we see now, a lot of athletes are coming out and talking about mental health. Yes. Because it's really taxing, you know, just think about every night as an athlete, you are on a stage mm-hmm. <laughs> performance every night, you know, yeah. expectations come with, with what you do and people don't look at you as being human at times. No. Like you, you and they also like, don't feel like, um, you should even have gripes, especially professionally, because of the amount of money that you get paid, which is so unfair. It's like their person is still having the same thoughts as a normal athlete would have that's not getting paid that amount of money. And right. and they also don't look at it like, OK, I make a lot of money, but I also have expensive things that has to be paid for. Yeah. So the scale is I'll get a lot of money, but I have a lot of expensive things or Mm -hmm. I live middle class and I have middle class things like yeah class things cost money middle class things cost money lower class things cost money it's all a level of stress in every level of it (laughs) right and you know if something happens and I mean you always have that um that thought in the back of your mind that somebody's going to come take your spot or yeah, for sure. You know, injuries and stuff like that stuff is real. And when there's people depending on you and your family's depending on you, and like you said, you have expenses and bills to pay and and the drop of a hat, you know, year after year. Yeah. When that contract comes up and it's ending, that could be stressful because it's like, oh, yeah, what if I don't get this amount of money. What if I get traded? What if they just totally drop me from the team? Right, there's 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 incidents where like NBA players played in the league for 10, 15 years are flat broke. Yeah. Flat broke because they didn't have financial advisors and they didn't have people to tell them where to put their money and you know they didn't know about that. And the good thing about like the league today is like they set you up with those things as rookies. Like those right. are things yeah that you have to do. It's almost like going to a, a seminar or you know, like freshman orientation mm-hmm. where everything is that. Now they have things like that set up in like the NBA and other places. And like, look at like Shaquille O'Neal. He's never spent like any money he's actually made. All his money's come off like endorsements. Endorsements, yeah. So, you know, there's a lot more enlightenment on on those type of things. But people just think that lifestyle is, is glitz and glamorous when you can't go anywhere without people knowing who you are. You can't be right. human. If you have a human moment or you have like a breakdown, now you're like the worst person in the world because. Mm-hmm you said something or you were mean to somebody like you know, you're human like right it's like people think they can say whatever they want to you 
and then they pull their phones out for your reaction. You know, yeah. I mean? it's 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 definitely tough to be like a, an athlete that's known and you know, but at the same time, you have to prepare yourself for it too. Yeah. You know, like you gotta expect people to be people and you have kind, rude, ignorant, you have all that, and you're gonna come across it as an athlete, and it just it just kind of defines like who you are and your character and on how you um how you respond to it. You know, yeah. there's times where I could have responded very negatively to what people have said or tried to do, but at the end of the day, I know that I represent something bigger than me. Right. Yeah. Especially like carrying that name on your back is like, there's a lot of people before you and hopefully there'll be a lot of people after you that carry your name, carry your last name. And I didn't want to be the one to tarnish it. You know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. So um, I just tried to always, you know, keep that at the, the front of my mind. Like, you know, you, you just walk away. Don't say nothing. You know, you know, there's times I was really close, you know, like, but, you know. Yeah, people will take you prevail, down. Cooler heads prevail, you know, and then it just becomes easier the more you learn how to deal with it. Yeah. Maturity does take account, too. Like, it does come into play where you just make better decisions because you've learned from other people. Right. And the things that they've done, you like, oh, I'm not about to be on TV. Right. I'm not, I'm not, you know, TV. I'm not trying to be in the paper at home. Right. You know, like, like uh, my dad used to always say, like, um, a smart man learns from his own mistakes and a wise man learns from other people's mistakes. Yeah. You know, so I would always say that in my head, like my dad used to tell me a million quotes and I don't know he, if he knows or not, but I would, I would like use them. Like, you know, he would always be like, I wouldn't feel like working out. And he'd be like, oh, uh, you you plow deep while the slug is asleep, like while that, lazy, <laughs> while that lazy person is sleeping, you get up and get some work done, and you you know get a, get ahead of the game. Yeah, Try to manage on your competition and people that are maybe what if there's a million people that want to go from Seton Hall to play basketball. You know what's going to separate you, or there's a million people that want to go overseas and do different things. What's how are you going to separate yourself and give you the best chance for success? So. Just those little, you know, those little things and little quotes, really, you know, when I didn't feel like doing things or maybe wanted to do something that wasn't the best, um, kept me in line a lot of the times. And that's a wrap on another amazing episode. I know that you were just as inspired as I was after listening to that conversation. And to let us know how we're doing, don't forget to leave us a review like, share, and follow the podcast. Also, make sure you follow us on all social media platforms at The Black Girl Blogger and check out our website, www.theblackgirlblogger.com. And the most important step, make sure you share the podcast with someone you know and tell them to share with someone they know. And if you know someone who has an amazing story to tell, or if you yourself would love to tell your story, leave us a message on our website or any of our social media platforms so we can reach out to you and have you on the podcast. Until next time, peace out.